Okay, looks like we're live, guys, um, according to the little green um, button. So we'll see if anybody joins. I'll just put a little thing. Feel free to add stuff to the chat as well if you guys have um, things you want to drop in. And um, I don't know if there's a hand raising capability if you want to interject with something, but if you do um, say want to jump in on something, um, just try to give me a little wave and I'll, I'll try to come to you. I don't see I don't see a hand raise function. So you may have to do that. I'll try to watch the chat though, um, in case anybody wants to add something and then keep an eye on um, turning back to you guys if uh, the order changes. Great. And uh, one last thing, I do find it helpful um, to keep it like the cell phone by my side. So if you want a second screen to look at, it's really handy. starting in just under one minute. Well, it's 8 o'clock. I'm Stan Stoniker with Hub Culture, and we are at the Horasis uh, Extraordinary Meeting with an extraordinary panel of experts to talk about the relationship between you and big data. So big data is all of that data that sits in the cloud, on the internet, and everywhere else that has some personal relevance to some aspect of yourself. And that covers many, many uh, types of areas. And we're going to dive into some of these areas with a really great panel of experts from all around the world. So I'm going to quickly introduce them, and then we're going to move in to some questions. Joining us is uh, Kohei Kurihara from Japan, CollabGate. And he's also with Privacy by Design, a nonprofit there, really focused on technology and blockchain. Patrick Lynch in Arizona. Uh, he's a clinical assistant professor of analytics and leadership at the Thunderbird School of Global Management in uh, the United States. Also in the United States is Jerry Power, who's joining us from the West Coast. He's the founder of i3 Systems. Then moving to the East Coast, we have uh, Mikolas Rambas, who's an entrepreneur in residence at Detroit Venture Partners 
And he's also the president of Quero, which is a pretty incredible uh, big data company. So welcome, gentlemen. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kohei, let's start with you. Uh, can you just give us a quick introduction about the work that you're doing in, in the realm of big data? We're going to go quickly through the group and uh, get a, a little introduction in before we dive into the big questions about the relationship between you and your data. Sure. Thank you for the sound and the introductions. I'm very honored to be a part of this moment. So my name is Kohei Fuhara. I'm from Japan, the co-founder of uh, Collaborate and Privacy Design Lab. Uh, the both business is uh, related to the data. My background is the marketing. Uh, almost uh, 10 years I've been uh, working on this space. Uh, I become interested in using uh, this data for the societies. Um, so the, my interest is also the focusing on the data privacy. It's uh, just an inclusive society necessary to uh, consider the, the, the privacy the human rights uh, based on the data society. So that's why I'm diving into the big data they're also society, it's a part of this. This is okay. my introduction. So, thank you, Kohei. Uh, big data and society and looking at the privacy side of that. We're going to dive deep into that in a few minutes. Um, Jerry, over to you. So, yeah, um, I'm a founder of i3 Systems. I also help set up the i3 Consortium. And what we're doing is we're looking forward to a day when IoT systems break out of the silos that are, are currently defined most of the way IoT networks are set up. Um, we want to make the, these IoT networks more collaborative, um, give the device owners a voice in how their data is used and who can see it, um, and facilitate both the data flows between data producers and data consumers. Okay, thank you. What a great what a great summary of the a very complicated world of IoT as we get started mm -hmm. here. Um, Mikolas? Sure. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, so as you mentioned, entrepreneur in residence. I've been an entrepreneur, gosh, since the age of 14, always looking at the ways in which uh, technology, in this case data, can apply to our lives. Uh, but more recently, uh, was the founder and CEO of a group called WealthX, which is the world's largest uh, database of information on wealthy individuals based out of Singapore. Uh, all open source intelligence, nevertheless, but have a perspective there from a consumer privacy cross jurisdiction. And then more recently, involved in Quero, the uh, world's largest customer data management platform. So very excited to be here. Thank you. Like, I think we've got some real experts. And um, Patrick. Uh, Stan and uh, also my colleagues, it's uh, great to be among you uh, for this program. Uh, I am now a, a full-time professor uh, at Thunderbird School of Global Management. I do instruct in big data analytics, decision-making uh, from undergrad all the way through to our continuing education for graduates. Uh, my personal interest in this, uh, continuing actually to collect uh, consumer data, uh, especially now in the age of uh, COVID or post-COVID, uh, looking at buying habits and certainly privacy are uh, among top concerns. Uh, prior to this, I was with a big data analytic uh, company focused on healthcare and pharmaceuticals, and I began my career in a think tank at Accenture, uh, looking at effectively similar kinds of adoptions of technologies uh, for consumers globally. Okay, thank you. So for the audience uh, that's joined us, thank you for uh, joining this this discussion about big data and uh, the idea of data ownership and data privacy, trust and transparency. In our earlier talks uh, with this group, I think we really were able to convene some kind of overarching themes that I want to share with you guys as we start to set out this next 45 minutes. And one of them was about the relationship between trust and privacy, the relationship about tr transparency and ownership and how all these four things vector across other groups like the companies and the platforms that hold the data for us, the individuals who the data is about, and increasingly um, the machines and the relationship between those machines and um, us. So that'll give you uh, as a viewer a little bit of a, a sense about where this is gonna be going. And we're gonna start with this kind of futuristic view about uh, the relationship of privacy. So going back uh, to you, um, Kohei, can you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on data decentralization and the blockchain? Everybody talks about blockchain being this magical tool for new types of uh, ownership methods. But what does it really mean for management transparency of our data? And is it real? 
Um, yeah, thank you for the questions. I, I think that the blockchain is the, one of the solutions to, to make the transparent operations. Uh, in this sense, the blockchain is not perfect. Uh, from the, the like the data protection perspective, such as GDPRs, uh, we have a lot of the discussion the whether the blockchain is the alternative tool, is the centralized service, the cloud machines, anything. But the problem is the blockchain, uh, in some architectures, uh, they are just uh, open, open, decentralized network. In this sense, who is the data controller? This is a very ambiguous point. That we are in a controversial how we can make it. So uh, unless we made any specific decisions, the blockchain, the data controllers, it's not the perfect solutions. I think the blockchain is more transparent than any other centralized solutions, but we have uh, uh, many products, uh, which is the better solutions. If we choose the one things, we lose anything. So that's a point, uh, the, the discussion from that part. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the challenges with blockchains has been the issue of scalability, because the idea of big data is, as the name implies, very, very big. And blockchains, by, by their nature of replication, create very, very large data sets. Now, one of the areas in uh, big data that is really exploding is the field of IoT, which for those of you who don't know IoT, it means Internet of Things. And these are machines, cloud-related, uh, like identities, bots, robots, all sorts of things like this that intersect with the Internet and are then spewing out data exhaust. So, Jerry, can you tell us, like, in the future... Do you think that data ownership is going to move beyond the idea of personal data? And how does that affect the IoT revolution? And then how does that loop back to the data we have about ourselves? Because many of these IoT machines are holding data about us little old humans. <laughs> so you, you raise an interesting point, and I, quite honestly, the way I think about it, I've given up on even talking about personal data. And, and the reason for that is with enough, I mean, if you say this data is personal and this data is not, you can take non-personal data, triangulate it with enough different data sources that are publicly available that you can still figure out where the data came from and what it says. So I, I think trying to say that there's some data that is more personal than others, um, yeah, you may be made a little bit harder, but really we have to start thinking of all the data we produce as being potentially personal personal data. Even, um, even, even anonymized data? Even anonymized data. You can, if, with enough other data around it that maybe you didn't get from the source, you can figure out where it came from. That's um, a very Cambridge Analytica to me. It, 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 it is. Um, but, but it's mathematically provable. And as IoT um, deploys, I think people will start collecting more and more data. Um, and we talk about consumers. That's true. People will generate data. Companies will generate data. Um, governments will generate data. So all of this data, once you start getting more and more of it, it will become easier and easier to identify people, um, even if you have anonymized the data. So I think we start have to look at um, all data as potentially personal data. Um, and this gets back to one of your original points, is if, if every data is personal, you only want to give the data to – organizations, companies that you really trust. Um, so you, you, this idea of having a, being able to give data to an untrusted party is something that you might have to do, but it's not something you should do, I'm thinking. Very interesting. I think we're going to get into that a little deeper with Patrick in a moment. But before we do that, I want to pick up on that thread that you just mentioned in, in your comment, Jerry, with Mikolas. So, mm -hmm. so this idea that there are kind of, I know you mentioned, Nicholas, that there are three big data universes, the U.S., Europe, and China. How are they approaching big data differently, especially in the context of what Jerry was just talking about there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and those lines continue to be sort of, uh, you know, gray and blurring, but nevertheless, you know, proximate to the zones. You know, I think in the U.S., we've been uh, conditioned for a long time to have already, in effect, you know, mortgaged our personal data, right, uh, ever since sort of magazines uh, have conditioned us to what we buy and how that ordering pattern and history is tracked and now online, you know, we're used to just giving that up, right? It's it's the agreement we have for the free services in many ways. I think there's a very different European mentality on data and the ownership of that. And then I think going, uh, you know, as we think about China, particularly in the universe around China, you know, the, this interesting dialogue certainly around personal data, but also around activity data. I think in China particularly, there's a lot more 
uh, of how that connects to the offline world as well as online, more so than you see in the U.S., certainly more so than you see in Europe. And so you have these different, if you will, zones of influence. And I think, you know, interesting to have the conversation today about the role of government in uh, the data that we're describing too, whether that's healthcare or IoT or you know, personal transactions. Um, but that will very much be, I think, a factor as we consider what happens to consumer data going forward. Okay. And um, I see Adam Jacoby, who's watching, has put a, a comment in the chat. And that's one of the great things about this new technology and the way that we're able to do these conversations. You do get more more feedback. So Adam, thank you. And for those of you who are also watching, please uh, add your thoughts and comments to the conversation so we can weave them into our uh, like uh, feedback. And so Patrick, I think what Adam's talking about here, where he asks about at what point do we start having conversations about the ethics of capability at the ID, ideation, technology, architecture, and planning stage is really relevant to what we were going to talk about with you, which is what is the relationship between trust, transparency, and ownership and how does that shift between people and data platforms? So it's kind of two things at once, but they're kind of getting to the same point about, you know, I think that, that concept of, like, is there an ethical responsibility for how this stuff is being managed before we even get to that ownership uh, and privacy discussion? Right, right. Well, I couldn't agree more that these things intersect. And we, when we talk about this with companies and, and indeed with students is that we have to actually begin with that at the start. The, the best way to do this is before you're uh, thinking about launching the new product or new service is that uh, you're stewarding effectively that data. So I think trust is actually a perception and, and we should get into how really different countries and cultures have a perception of trust that differ. There is good evidence that people want to protect different types of data about them in different ways. I think we should come back to that. But you're asking about, you know, where does it begin and at, at what point do we uh, start thinking about uh, the ethics or what's appropriate to do? And as we say, that has to actually be at the foundation or the core. And if you are thinking ahead of time about being transparent with that data, uh, about having uh, really stewardship, we don't think about it as ownership, um, everyone has an obligation, a felt obligation, a moral obligation, an ethical obligation. Um, you, if you if you don't start with that, then you're really in a world of hurt. Um, and then obviously there are unintended consequences of things that can happen after the fact. But uh, we really firmly believe that this is a strong foundation uh, and, and something that we are trying to impart in uh, our students, for example. Can, can I just add a story to that? This uh, this is something that was really formative to me, but I at one time was doing some ethnographic research, and one of the things we did is we uh, were asking people about how they use data. Uh, one of the, the groups of people we talked to, it was actually uh, a house full of uh, college co-eds, um, and when one of the co-eds was starting to date somebody new, Everybody else in the house got together. They got on the social network. They searched for information to figure out whether this person was a creep or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a, a room full, a, a whole house full of, of young ladies trying to take care of one another. But it's that same idea, that same technology could be used by somebody who was looking to stalk somebody. Mm -hmm. So the same technology, to Adam's point, could be used for good or bad. Um, the question is, is what's an ethical use about it and how do you try and make sure people are doing the right thing with the data that they have access to? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that kind of points, Jerry, to this trend. I think there is a trend that we're seeing right now in popular culture. If you just look at, you know, Netflix and the social dilemma is trending right now, it talks about what might be thought of as the unintended consequences of big data in the context of social media and a kind of naivete that existed about how that data would be used. And then The Great Hack, which um, was also a great um, documentary that looked at the 2016 election and how big data was used to, to create essentially a personal psychographic for every single voter in America, and then to target them down to the very last voter to try to sway them. And so these were, um, in, in The Great Hack, it was referred to as, you know, essentially a weapon of, of like major consequence. It wasn't the exact words, but you know, Clay, I'm curious to come back to you a little bit about, do you think that this idea of digital identity when big data can create a known personality for every single person, probably on the planet, does that point us for a better future or 
a more scary s- a s- future. And who do you think should own and control such a system? Um, that's a good point. I think the, uh, we have a two kind of perspectives. One is the technical solution. The other is the data governance. Uh, in terms of the data governance, which has a different dialogues of uh, uh, data privacy, a lot of engineering so far is uh, thinking about data privacy will be protected on technical solutions. But the problem is whether this data is linked to the individual or not, right? Uh, as a Jerry first to speak, that the anonymized data might be connected to the individual. In that sense, if these technologies are perfectly to prove this is anonymity, but you connect those data to the person, in this sense, it's a personal data. So from that perspective, uh, even the technology says this is a perfect, but the data governance is not a perfect. In this sense, a lot of the data will be abused. So this is not a perfect. So we tend to talk about identity first, but the problem is uh, how these specific organization using this data for the purpose. So I think the purpose-driven orientation is the, the one specific solutions. Besides the technical approach, identity is one of them. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, that, that seems to me to point a little bit towards, like, where we're going with AI, because AI feeds on big data, and we're really in a system race on the AI front. Um, for AI systems that will be effectively pervasive. You know, Jerry, like if we kind of take that back, I mean, I don't think of AI as like a super bot, but it kind of is a super bot. And you could argue that a lot of AI generates its knowledge, so to speak, from IoT. What kind of new opportunities emerge in a world where all these different types of devices hold data about us? And then how do you think that impacts the relationship with the companies that create those those platforms or devices? I, I think we're going to see a sea change over the next five, ten years. Um, certainly companies who are making these devices, they're uh, building the devices to be more intelligent so that they're generating data. Um, at first, when they do this, they're looking to collect data about how the product's being used um, ideally, they're using that data to improve their products so that they can provide better products to the customer and the customer benefits from that. Um, but over time, I think people will will start to realize this is what's going on. And, and uh, I think Patrick has before mentioned how younger people are more attuned to this than maybe people who are older. I'm going to say my age. Um, but... Um, to get people to give you their data, you've got to build that trust relationship with them. Um, so I think that as companies start using data and their strategies become dependent on the way the data, uh, the data they get, they want to maintain that relationship. So they'll have to start doing things to build a better, a more trusted relationship with the customer. Um, that, that's certainly the way I hope it's going to play itself out. I think that's really important for the context of the pandemic and COVID. Mm -hmm. So before we wrap up our conversation, I think we should skate back to that because we are seeing, I think, a rapid, rapid um, evolution in the way that data is being used with regard to healthcare in the context of the pandemic. But before we go there, now, Mikolas, you mentioned in your opening that you were at Mm WellFact. So you have a pretty interesting view about maybe how wealthy people talk about and manage their relationship with data versus maybe how the rest of us do. So I'm kind of curious, what are the tools of the rich in terms of managing their data that we could be learning from? Sure. So, so I'd actually start with awareness actually, right? So just to come back to this conversation, by the way, I forgot to mention that I was at Equifax as well during the big data breach that happened a few years back. So that's a, yeah. another dialogue, that's right? Fun. But If you look at some of the hearings that ensued as a result and you look at some of the questions that were asked by Congress of Equifax uh, or in in following up on, let's say, uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal on Facebook, you know, there is a, I'd say, general lack of awareness about just how much information, at least by the American consumer, is handed over, right? And how the system works, if you will, so to speak. So I think there's the question as to how uh, active and engaged consumers will be. I think as we talk about wealth and how this looks a bit differently, 
I think uh, increasingly wealthy individuals are aware of the data uh, that is out there about them, whether that's concern about the reputational risk, physical safety, uh, and other things. They've got assets they're looking to protect, but there's an increasing amount of awareness of their data and how to hold that back. That perhaps in some ways that's, uh, you know, I'll call the, the Swiss tradition, right? Most wealthy people are aware of uh, opportunities to perhaps uh, hide their wealth. Uh, and, and so that's you know, happened over time. But then again, there is a more built in awareness of the value of this data and somehow, right, being able to stay more, so to speak, off the grid uh, or put things in LLCs or through businesses versus having all that personal information about oneself or one family out there for others to see, right? So even the example of the information of co-eds looking up information about uh, someone new in their community, let's say, versus that information being used for stalking. I think that, that wealthier community has been more aware of those issues and those risks over time. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing will be is where does a consumer, the average consumer, end up in this? Do they, again, based on uh, you know, background and culture and so forth, do they really care? And what are the ways we're going to either approve or allow right, our information to be shared? Yeah, I mean, it does raise the question about whether or not there's a business in this. Is there a business in privacy and what does that look like? I mean, Equifax and, you know, the, the, the credit rating agencies have made a good business out of helping a person be able to understand what companies think about them in terms of a credit score and everything else. But it'd be very interesting to think about like a privacy score or some way that a person would be able to understand, you know, the rest of the data thing that goes beyond just a credit score. Patrick, where does that take you? Um, Cause you're, you're really talking to a lot of companies who are thinking about new models. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that we live in this world with like theoretically data monopolies where you have a few companies who control vast amounts of data about us. I'm just curious if you think that that's real or given how competitive the tech landscape is, if it's just fleeting, like, do we need to be worried about data monopolies in the current realm? Well, I, I mean, I think it's fascinating to think about what a data monopoly might look like. I, I think that there are many uh, companies actually that have a vast amount of information mm-hmm. about us. And, and actually, I think it's a point that all of us are making uh you know, on the panel here is that what data you're talking about that you want to keep private, uh, you just brought it up. I, I think we absolutely see that there's an industry to uh, maybe protect that data. Uh, it's already happening at a small scale, even for probably most uh, of us attending today, maybe we have a website. We all know that we're offered when we uh, register the website to keep certain information private, but we have to pay a little bit more. Uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Tom Davenport, we wrote about this in the attention economy way back in 2001, talking about an industry of attention protection, or, you know, you could say it is privacy protection, but what you're really doing is attention protection. You don't want the uh, worry that somebody could find out something about you uh, that uh, you wish to, you know, sort of keep private. But we do see that it's not just um, the the data itself, but culturally there are differences around the globe on what data should be kept private uh, in different cultures or because of policies or government. Um, there are some people that don't put a lot of value on uh, uh, certain types of private information that yet other cultures would pay a lot to keep private. Uh, there was an excellent study done by Morley and colleagues as late as 2015, I believe, that asked uh, customers this. And uh, many people were, well, first of all, they're unaware that the data was being collected. That point has been uh, shared even tonight. But even once you told them that they, depending on the culture or the policy that they're living under, it, it may not be a big concern. And so some would look at it as a, a benefit of what they're getting in exchange. So again, I think it comes back to that transparency and trust. Uh, if you know that you're getting something of value, uh, maybe you're not so concerned about it. And we can't just take a, a broad brush and say it's all data. It's going to be certain types of data. It depends on what it's used for, who you're sharing it with, and, and where you live. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's difficult because the very definition of big data makes it, I think, hard for us to understand it in human terms, to kind of think about, you know, we don't have the time to think about how all of our data is being used. We don't even know most of the data that's being generated about us ourselves. And so that element of trust, and then I think to the question earlier from our audience about about the ethics of that, I do want to dive more into that ethics element because it does 
raise a question about whether or not there should be more. And I, I think as an educator, Patrick, it's interesting to, to think about whether or not programmers should be taking ethics courses or, um, you know, entrepreneurs should be thinking about that. Yeah, well, uh, we, we certainly, uh, per, you know, we definitely teach that. And I can see a comment uh, in in the chat, you know, what about data for good? Can it be used for good? And it absolutely can be. There's lots of evidence now, especially through IoT devices and remote sensing, that we actually learn new information can be more efficient. Um, I have a colleague today we actually just had as a, a guest speaker. Uh, they are in agribusiness and they use IoT sensors to ensure that all the equipment is uh, where it needs to be. And it's very it's very clear fact that it is only because of uh, the sharing of data and uh, these kinds of things actually reduce the, the cost and inefficiencies out of the system by uh, the willingness to share on an open platform with other other people uh, in agribusiness because you're really talking about an ecosystem there. And that can be a profound difference, especially in developing countries. So yes, it's a, it's not a, that's why it's just not one, so, one brush. Mm -hmm. So sure. one, I was gonna say one of the things, then this sort of builds on that data for good. Um, one of the, the projects I worked on, I was trying to understand how people valued data. And, and I was using students as focus groups um, and, Quite honestly, they saw um, tools that help them manage their data as having benefit because it saves them time. This is a good thing. Um, when you start talking to them about possibly getting paid um, for the data that they produce, um, you, you see a, a, an incremental uh, desire to participate in the data ecosystem. But the thing that really amazed me, and again, this is a student population, so a, a younger generation, was the thing that sort of pegged the interest in participating in the data economy was when you told them that the data they generated could be given to or, or used by to help fund a charity that they cared about. I mean, they realize that they're out generating data with just about everything they do. And the fact that by participating and in, in giving people permission to use the data, they're actually doing good. They saw that as a very powerful and a very strong message. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Kohei, there was a question a minute ago about uh, blockchains and how uh, anonymity and audit auditability um, can be created to rebuild trust. You know, can you dive a little bit more into how you see blockchains doing this? Because there is this thing about, like, blockchains in a way are are progenitors of even more big data because the concept of blockchain is that you're repeating the data across many databases. So even just like my birth date on a blockchain may be repeated a million times. And so there is, like, one of the, I think, weaknesses of blockchains. It's really good for transparency. It's pretty good for anonymity sometimes. Um, and it's really good for reconciling all of us. So if the five of us were a blockchain and we wanted to share my birth date across all five of us, we'd have five records of that. It makes it very difficult for, for Jerry to come in and hack my birth date, right? <laughs> so that's kind of the value of it. But how does that like work when you're com combining big data with big blockchain? Because it seems like that's just like an explosion of the data. Is it practical or do we have to look at other things to, to make it actually practically useful for people? Um, in this context, we have to reconsider our current uh, data protection regulations because the old Data Privacy Act or regulation is to comprise to the uh, data controllers who are going to be responsible to control their data. In the blockchain, it's, uh, it's a decentralized model, basically. In this sense, uh, we need to work on the decentralized model based on the individual. So this is a very controversial because the, the, the currently is all the data protection laws need to put the specific person or companies uh, in charge of uh, data operations. And the blockchain is the automatic processes in between the decentralized networks. So this is the one thing we need to overcome. All the things is to go to blockchains. So this is not just uh, the kind of technical things. It's just a kind of the political regime change, the game change is necessary for the privacy protections or data utilities for the societies now. In addition, I can add some context of uh, uh, data and good. Um, in, in this context, uh, we have a lot of the issues in the societies because if you 
if the specific objective has no specific access to the data, they are out of the scope. In this sense, like some poverty is the people or with the disabled is not able to access the, some specific database, they cannot to be a part of them in the society. So this is the one things we need to overcome first with inclusive societies on the data. Yeah, it's almost like data inclusion alongside financial inclusion. Yeah, of course, but, absolutely. But, but I want to come back to a part of that. In, I don't look at blockchain as doing anything um, to do with building trust. Um, and, I, and I'm saying that because I had maybe it's because from the person who asked the question, I have a different definition of trust. Um, as Kohei said, the, the idea in blockchain is, is to decentralize control so that one administration cannot sort of dominate and sort of overwrite and screw things up. Um, but it gets the data from one side to the other in a decentralized control environment. Mm -hmm. Blockchain doesn't do anything about once the data gets to a person, if that person is unethical or going to use the data in a bad way, blockchain did nothing to stop that. So, so the idea of what is a trusted system is not just that you've made the communications or the database secure. It's a much more systemic issue that you have to think about. But if I can weave that together, right? So we talked about data monopolies. Uh, you know, the if I, if I were to go to macro, right, I'd say the last 30 years of competitive advantage for businesses, large enterprise, but also governments and advancements for their people have been driven around information technology, right? Those countries, those organizations that have leveraged it have been very successful. Arguably, that arbitrage has run out, and now we're in the era of data as a competitive advantage, AI as a competitive advantage. It's why it's on the agenda of countries like the US, Russia, China, and others. And so to be very successful in AI, we need large amounts of data to inform right, AI systems. We all, we all have that background. And so I think you know, as we think about control and what role, again, governments play in this as well as large companies, it's absolutely in those organizations' best interest to as much control as possible to speed this evolution, to have that edge in AI. I think that's, you know, we can, we can go back to sort of the, the nation competitive conversation. That's why I think we're going to see a focus on control and centralization and maybe not monopolies, but definitely oligopolies on how this data is managed. You know, think about, again, take an Apple, for example, or other organizations who are you know, driving massive valuations. Think about the next frontier of data, whether it's IoT or healthcare or education, right? The more data that that can inform uh, those views and models and the rest, that's where the next billion dollar, next sorry, I should say, next trillion dollars of enterprise value or even you know uh, GDP is going to come from. And that's to me like the big story of where the emphasis, the activity, uh, and again the race for control is going to go. You know, it reminds me of like I don't know when you're kids, like you ever saw that poster with like all the Ferraris and other cars in the garage, and it said. The one who dies with the most toys wins. It feels like now, like the AI with the most data wins. And when you look at, kind of going back to that, that thread with you earlier, Mikolas, about these three major systems that seem to be emerging in the world. There's a, a U.S., from a government pr perspective, a U.S. perspective, there's a European perspective, there's a China perspective. I've, I've talked to people about the idea of a couple of different AI models merging. And in the far future, this is my favorite part with our last few minutes, um, to get into this view about the, the, is big data really an AI story? What, how would all of you guys feel about that? And if it is an AI story, does that mean that it's actually a national story? Because it seems like either nations are going to evolve in We uh -oh. just lost them. Up oh, there you are. There we are. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, I lost you guys for a second. Did you catch all that? I think we might have lost Jerry. No, you got me. I think there's a nation that's listening to you right now. <laughs> Actually, it's probably the AIs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's let you all respond to that. Wait, sorry. We the last five minutes of your, five seconds of your question was cut off. Oh, it was part sorry, of the previous was, part, which is like, like will AIs evolve into nations, and will nations evolve into AIs? Like this is like I think mm -hmm. the fundamental question. And in this sense, like for people, if it's going to be a race to have the best AI built on having the most data, how, like I don't see how individuals win that data war because it's like a matter of national survival. So. 
So, so go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. So and briefly, I would just say I think I think you're right. I think there's a role for government to play early on from a regulation perspective, says the American right regulation. But nevertheless, I think there, there's potentially a role for government to play in laying the foundation for some of this, knowing that it's going to be a race amongst major players. Without it, we'll have what we've had happen so far with consumer data of the Facebook, of the Google, and other styles, which I think is not what anyone believes would be the right thing for healthcare data or education or otherwise. That's my, my quick view. Patrick? Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll defer. <laughs> Jump in. Come on. <laughs> So, so I have. A, I'll take a different view. Um, in in that, um, I think that for companies, countries. I'll even say for countries, because right now I would say there's a lot of distrust of of government, um, certainly in in this country. Um, but I think for anyone to collect the data that allows their AI engines to be successful, they've got to win the support of the people, and that means that they have to involve them in the conversation. So this idea of people giving your data and then losing control of it, I think, continually evaporates and disappears. Do you, because look at um, China and facial recognition. I don't think that's happening in China. No, but but China's a different country. I, I'm sort of doing it from uh, on our standpoint. I also, and, and this, I know this is a thing that uh, in L.A. they worry about, is L.A. is such a large city for the city to deploy all the IoT devices that they could dream of that they want to. It's economically un, unrealistic. So the only way for um, L.A. to, in long term, to be successful is that they have to um, elicit get the support of citizens of companies so that they're all contributing their data to help the city run operationally more efficient. If the city had to just replicate every device that all these companies and all these other people had instead of trying to leverage the data, um, the economics just won't work. Now, in in China, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't thought through that. (laughs) Um. I guess the, the, the general question that I'm hearing is, uh, you know, are we are we edging toward that future with, I guess, loss of control, I guess, is what I, I guess you're ultimately saying if, if governments and AI are the AI. Um, I, I actually really do agree that it's going – trust is based on risk and reward, and we're social – to the fundamentals, that's actually our competitive advantage is what we are doing really through our own networks to each other. So I do think that the history, whether it's through regulation because you're from a U.S. perspective or through other means of societal change that we witness globally today when uh, the populace feels that things really have tipped the other way to where there's some kind of an abuse. I think we already have an answer of what that looks like. There are revolutions uh, fought over those kinds of things. So while I'm not predicting that, I think that there's checks and balances along the way. And what's fascinating are conversations like these that we can begin uh, to lay that foundation because we really are at a tipping point because of the volume of data. I mean, frankly, I don't need to know really who you are in order to triangulate and, and target. And there are companies that you can do business with today uh, through anonymous data, just looking at your behavior, it can make it feel very personalized as if I actually know you. Uh, so that's why we need to continue to have this conversation. And it's going to be a mix of policy and procedure that companies and governments need to come together uh, over the next five or 10 years to figure this out. Okay. For our viewers, we have about five uh, minutes left in this conversation. I don't know if we will magically have the AI uh, switch us to oblivion at that point. Uh, but if you have any questions you'd like to add for the panel, um, please type them into the chat and we will try to uh, in- incorporate that, weave that into the conversation. Um, there was a person, um, Severe, who asked um, if Jerry was talking about hybrid approaches to building trust through technology. So, you know, w- what would be an example of a hybrid approach, especially because you are working on uh, some of these things? And then for the rest of us, as we wrap up um, with our last couple of minutes, I'd love to just hear your thoughts about um, this in the context of the pandemic. Just uh, what can we be doing as citizens to, to manage this data um, explosion in, in a good way? And give you each a, a last chance to wrap up, starting with Jerry. 
<laughs> so, so yeah, um, I am talking about a hybrid approach because I do. I, th I think it was Warren Bennis who who said that um, trust is the lubricant that lets financial transactions take place. And it's interesting to take statements like that um, and replace financial transactions with data transactions, um, and, and you end up in some really interesting places. In fact, I even occasionally will play back the feedback or, or these sessions again. Wherever we said data, I'll replace the word data with money and see whether it reads the same way. An interesting kind of exercise to think about it. Um, but as you think about how do we manage money, who do we decide we want to um, do business with when we want to buy a product? Do we go to the cheap store or do we go to the, the, the more expensive store that has better service? Do we pay with cash? Do we pay with credit card? All the decisions that have to go around it, it's not that you can say there's one thing that makes a difference. It's, it's the bigger picture. Do you, do you like the? Do you trust the the shopkeeper that he's going to take your return when you bring it back? You've got to look at all those things together before it really starts to make sense. Okay, Jerry, Nicholas. Yeah, I'll come back. Come back to me if you would. Okay, go ahead. We have a couple <laughs> two minutes left. So. Yeah. Okay, uh, we need a democratic data system. I guess it's just a kind of the uh, we need a watchdog who. Uh, assessed from the third party perspective in the sense it's very hard to one company control everything. If the other parties are coming to the processes, it's been equal. I think uh, this kind of the democratic data ecosystem is necessary after the COVID-19. Okay. Patrick? Uh, I guess quickly, I think the, the big picture, and I don't have a solution to this, is we're going to somehow need to engineer and also adopt some way to forgive and forget because we are all building an immutable record. And the real thing about privacy that we're not talking about is the anachronistic consequences of something I do today that impacts me five, 10 years down the road. And we can't just uh, rely on plausible deniability because it's in the record. Um, the, the other thing that you mentioned was, um, actually I forgot the other part of the question, but I was just, I think that this is really where we need, we need to go. Um, yeah. I'm so sorry. Any, any final thoughts on COVID and the pandemic? On COVID, yeah, I mean that's an example where we're trading we're trading personal information for the greater good, and I I just I think that puts a really fine point on it where uh, if we all collaborate and cooperate, we might actually be better off. And so there it is that that trade and trust. So we need some way to exchange value. You know, I'm giving you something personal, but it is for the greater good. And we are on new, you know, we are certainly on new levels now that. I can think with confidence, I can say at scale, we've never seen in human history uh, the ways that uh, private information like that uh, is being shared or can be shared or we need to voluntarily share or some of us are being forced to share. And so that's a, it's an excellent question. Hmm. Yeah. Just, just briefly, I, I started by saying, you know, I see these three sort of universes of data and uh, with COVID, if there's, you know, uh, hopefully, the need to share healthcare data across the world will start to break down some of those a bit. And hopefully that will help you know, as we go forward and trying to figure out, right, how data is managed in the future. Great. Well, we just have a few seconds left. Um, on behalf of the panel, thank you very much. Thank you for our viewers. Thank you to uh, Horasis and the Extraordinary Meeting. Uh, you can find more conversations all week uh, online. I'm Stan Stoliker from Hub Culture. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think, yeah, great. I don't, um, it says I'm still live, but it also says that we're out of time. So <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> I can only see Jerry now on the screen. It's so uh, <laughs> as far as the recording will be there. But for any of you who are still here, um, Gina and uh, Voldemir and George, thanks for joining uh, the conversation. Um, I think they may have jumped to the next um, panel discussion, but anything else you guys want to wrap up, um, we can do so. Otherwise, we can kind of edit, end it there. Thank you very much. 
Well, thanks, Stan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look forward to maybe we, I see some of you are already connected on LinkedIn and I think it's fascinating. We need a lot more than 45 minutes to explore this and uh, I'd love to know how we can help each other. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I'd love to bring you guys onto a podcast discussion for the Hub Culture Chronicles. You can uh, see a lot of our discussions about the future of um, technology uh, on iTunes. Just search Hub Chronicles and maybe we could dive in a bit more with you guys as a follow-up with a partnership with Heresis. It'd be really good to, to do that. It's fantastic. Sounds good. I think yeah. it's important that we continue these conversations. Yeah, Thanks. I think I think there's some really good points in this about that idea of like a like an Equifax for privacy. I thought was amazing, and some of your points, Patrick, about um, how you know are there frameworks for embedding the ethics into some of this stuff? It's really really quite interesting. Not a lot, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I agree. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you all. Have a good, have <laughs> yeah. a good day wherever you wherever you are. It's late for some of you, especially Nicholas. It's like two in yeah. the morning for you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. bye. bye.